Welcome back, everybody. My first guest tonight is an historian and the best-selling author of How to Be an Anti-Racist and Stamped from the Beginning. Please welcome Professor Ibram X. Kendi. Professor Kendi, thanks for being here. Oh, it's a pleasure to be on the show. Um, now you're America's leading scholar on anti-racism, and your 2019 book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, is currently a number one nonfiction uh, bestseller. What's the difference between being not racist and being anti-racist? Well, historically, whenever people are challenged for saying and doing something that's racist, typically their response is, I'm not racist. No matter what they just said, no matter what they just did, by contrast, someone who is striving to be anti-racist is actually willing to admit the times in which they express racist ideas. They're willing to admit the times in which they sort of support racist policies because they're in a process of changing. They're changing themselves. They're seeking to change society. They're not necessarily in denial like many Americans who claim they're not racist. Well, I, 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 like, I like that framing of, of the conversation because I, like I'm sure many of Americans, have examined their conscience, especially over the last four weeks, and said, I, I'm, I am a white American. I've benefited from our, our racist, systemic racism in our society, and I can't say honestly that I don't uh, have any racism. Um, but, but the reframe that you put it uh, allows a, a hope for change. Well, I mean, and humans have the capacity to change, and, and I think we have to allow for that. And the question is always, and I think with anything, when, when someone diagnoses us, when somebody explains that we have some sort of problem, the question I think for all of us is, are we gonna deny that problem? Are we gonna deny that addiction even? Or are we going to admit it and then begin the process of changing ourselves, healing ourselves so that we can change and heal this country? And another thing I like about the way you've done this is that, you know, while uh, uh, not a racist and anti-racist, both might be described as an identity, anti-racist implies action. Oh, it does. And, and really, I'm not racist is an identity because typically a people, person believes that's who they are. And, mm -hmm. and for somebody who's being anti-racist, it's, it's, it's more so what they're being based on what they're saying and, and what they're doing. And so anti-racists know that if they're expressing that the racial groups are equals, they're being anti-racist. If they're challenging racist policies, they're being anti-racist. So you actually have to do something and, and be something in order to be anti-racist. Can you be both racist and anti-racist at the same time? Because I'll give you an example. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. That is baldly an anti-racist statement written by a racist man. And even that statement. So you had some people who at the time believed that we were all created equal, which was an anti-racist idea. But then they also believed, let's say, Black and even Native people became inferior on Earth. In other words, their cultures are inferior. They are inferior because of their environment. So we were all equal to begin with. But as a result of the cultures of black people or even native people, they're inferior right now. I have a question about the history of racism. Is what we think of as racism a modern, and I mean 500 years old, a modern European colonial idea that is merely a subset of inequality? Or has there always been some form of racial discrimination? So for a very long time, you can look into, the, into antiquity and see sexism and see ethnocentrism uh, and see obvious religious persecution, but racism is a modern phenomenon. The concept of race, Black Africa, Native America, even white Europe, is a modern phenomenon that largely comes out of the slave trade, largely comes out of colonialism and, and, and slavery. So why did that, if there have always been sort of like, you know, man's inhumanity to man, why did that, did the sort of the economic um, desire to exploit Africans lead to the justification of it through racism? Exactly. And so, in other words, really the, 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 really the core, the heart, the cradle of, of racism is, is self-interest. In other words, I want to slave trade or enslave 
African people, even native people. And so therefore I'm gonna create policies that make all these different ethnic groups, one people, one people worthy of enslavement. And then I'm gonna argue that these people are inferior. They're savage people. So, so therefore they should be enslaved. They should be driven from their land that I'm supposedly civilizing. So you see the self-interest has led to the racist policies and the racist policies have led to the racist ideas. And then people believe that these peoples were barbaric and savages, which then made them ignorant and hateful. Well, we may not always have had racism as we perceive it, but humans have always had self-interest. How can, how can you, how can we make it so that being anti-racist is in your self-interest? Well, I think for the vast majority of Americans, being anti-racist or creating a more equitable society is actually in their self-interest. And, and I think that, for instance, white Americans are, are constantly thinking about what they would lose with a radical sort of renovation uh, of, of this country, of, its, of this country's policies, as opposed to what they would gain. So they're too quick to compare themselves to people of color, as opposed to comparing themselves to what people in other Western democracies have. And then the question is, why don't we have paid family leave in the United States? Why don't everyone have access to free health care? Why is there so much income inequality? And one of the reasons you can point to is, is racism and people being constantly manipulated to sort of supporting policies and policymakers against their own self-interest by racist ideas. And, and the, the cudgel of the welfare queen being used to destroy the idea of any sort of social safety net that sort of I saw, you know, growing up in the 1980s. Exactly. And it was a social safety net that wasn't just helping black women or black people. It was helping all Americans, all Americans who, who of course, at times are going to fall and, and need a, a safety net to catch them, to lift them back up. There was nothing wrong with that. Now, um, you say that racist and anti-racist are not fixed identities. Um, you've got an amazing example of someone who's clearly steeped in racism who has become an active anti-racist. Tell the story of um, the David Duke's godson. Oh, yeah. A few years ago, I had the pleasure of meeting um, Derek Black. Derek Black is the the son of Don Black. Don Black created the website Stormfront. It was really one of the major sort of progenitors of the white nationalist movement. It really groomed his son, Derek, to become like one of the leaders of, of the white nationalist movement, to really become like a Richard Spencer. But when Derek Black went to college, he started, some of his friends took him to the side and, and started challenging some of his, his ideas and ultimately, he began changing. I understand he read one of my books along the way and many other books on, on racism. And now he's someone who's striving to be anti-racist. So someone who was raised to lead the white nationalist movement is now striving to be anti-racist. Um, one of the changes going on right now, one of the cultural changes, like monuments being pulled down, perhaps changing the names of army bases that are named after Confederate generals. I have found out that your high school, you went to Stonewall Jackson High School in Virginia, and there was a petition, over 30,000 signatures, to rename that the Imbram X. Kendi High School. And I know this doesn't come from you, but this is happening. How did this come about, and, and how do you feel about that? Well, well, I think, obviously, I'm happy that they're finally changing the name of my high school since it was named after a Confederate general. But I understand people are pushing for this. And one of the people who are pushing for it, I understand, is the great, great grandson of, of Stonewall Jackson, uh, who, you know, I think is really, you know, a class act, Warren Christian. And he's really showing that we are really not bound by our ancestors, just like we're not bound by the past history of this country's racism. We can create a different type of country that's going to really respect and value Black lives and, and the lives of people of color. Now, you've also released another book called Anti-Racist Baby. Why did you decide to write a book about anti-racism uh, for, for babies? Well, I mean, I, I first and foremost have a, a very young daughter, and I, I wanted to have a tool for her. I mean, I know that at six months, the babies are already seeing race. I know at two years old, some children are already 
consuming or believing in racist ideas and discerning who to play with based on a kid's skin color. And I also know that many parents believe their kids are colorblind. And, but if their, their kids are anything but according to the studies. And, and we should be teaching our kids about racism and being anti-racist even before they can fully understand what that means. Just like we teach them what it means to be kind, what it means to love. These are sophisticated concepts, kindness and love, what we teach our kids early because we value being kind and, and loving and we should value being anti-racist. And the earlier we teach our kids to be anti-racist, the better. Now, as I said, you're, you're, you're a leading voice against racism in the United States. Your wife is an ER doctor at a children's hospital in DC. She's fighting COVID on the front lines. What gives the two of you hope? Because you're both part of a present vital struggle. Well, I think for, for, for us, I think what, what gives us hope is that you have to believe change is, is, is possible in order to bring it about. And so when she diagnoses a, a young child who has a serious illness, she believes that that kid, that that child can be healed. She has to believe it, right? Like doctors have to believe that. Just like when I diagnose America as, as racist, when I say that even America has stage four metastatic racism, I still believe that, that America can, can, can fight against the odds and, and still heal itself. Well, um, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, uh, thanks for the message, thanks for the hope. And thanks for the example. Of course, yeah, thank you so much. Anti-Racist Baby and Stamped Racism, Anti-Racism and You are both available now. Ibram X Candy, everybody. We'll be right back with comedian Patton Oswalt. Thanks again, sir.